MIT University. Let's go! Hello friends, welcome back to the vlog. And today we'll be talking about MIT University. And here we have the graduate of MIT University, Mr. Yuri. Good morning, Mr. Yuri. Morning, Mr. Matif. How are you? Good, good. Good morning, dear friends. Are you ready for the interview? Yes, sir. Can let's we get started? Let's do it. Okay, let's get started. The first question, what kind of university is MIT? Good question. First of all, what, what is MIT? MIT stands for Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Okay. Technology is the key word in this name because that is, that is the core of MIT. That is why MIT was founded actually 1861. 160 years ago. So it is a pretty old university, uh, established, well known, uh, and uh, it, is, it is, again, first and foremost, it is a technical university that educates uh, students, undergraduates, graduates, PhDs in, in different sciences. So 80% of its students study science or math or engineering. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, it's very famous and top university. And the question is, what kind of students does MIT want to teach? Well, uh, if you look at MIT's motto, it says, uh, mens et amus. It means uh, mind to hand. So apply your knowledge to problems that exist, right? If you think about what, what do engineers do? They try to solve something that exists, right? So you, you take your deep knowledge of a subject and, and you use it. So it's very, MIT is a very, uh, uh, the culture of the university is very hands-on. So it's, it's, it's not only theory, theory is important of course, but they want to make a difference. They're educating their students, they're teaching their students at all levels to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. All right, the next question is more formal. Um, I think you must be genius to start studying in MIT and what other requirements for entering MIT? Let me give you a uh, two-fold answer. There are 12,000 12, students studying at MIT. Mm -hmm. So they're probably hard to come up with 12,000 geniuses. <laughs> so you don't have to be a genius to be there, right? But you do need to be pretty smart and hardworking. And I would say hardworking even more important, okay? And again, uh, the requirements, in order to talk about requirements, I have to mention one important fact. There are five schools at MIT, right? So five divisions. Uh, one, the biggest one is engineering. Number two is sciences. Number three is humanities and art. Then there is business school, and then there is school of architecture. Now, sciences, all five schools have different requirements. Obviously, to get into physics and say to get into business, they're different subjects, they're different skill sets. You do need to be a not only a top student, but also a very committed one. But the requirements obviously vary from school to school, from subject to subject. So if, if somebody wants to, to really apply, they need to look deeper, and it's all on the website, but they need to, to dig a bit deeper and basically see what each school and each specialty, there are 44 degrees at MIT. Five schools, 44 degrees. So each degree has its own unique set of requirements. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, I think lots of people watched on YouTube how MIT students study. They think that they spend their time all the time at lab or the library. But we want to know the reality. How do MIT students actually study? They only study or they have some social life also? Well, I mean, they do study a lot, uh -huh. right? Because, again, to be to succeed, uh, to be, it, it's not only important to get to MIT, it's important to stay at MIT, right? <laughs> yes. Because again, if people, if, if you don't pass your exams, you're, you're going to fail out. So, so the thing is, they study a lot, some of them study all the time, but of course there's social life, right? Yes. There's, it's, they have big enough a campus, and there are many events happening, there's obviously, there's a lot of athletic events, there are a lot of cultural events, a lot of interesting people come to MIT, it's also in the center of Boston, well, technically speaking in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but in, in Boston, greater metropolitan area. A lot of people come there, a lot of speakers, so it, it depends on students. There's mm -hmm. a lot of choices, uh, and they can decide how much to study, how much social life to have. Mm -hmm. Students are students, people are people, so social life is important. Of course, thank you. And the next question is, I think everyone is interested in this question, what is the tuition fee of MIT? 
Okay, good question. Uh, again, uh, let me give a quick clarification because there is there is a bit of a misconception about how tuition works in the United States, for example. Uh, and when I speak about the tuition, it all does not only apply to MIT, it applies to other big schools as well, for example, like Harvard, because their tuition levels are approximately similar. Officially, if you go to MIT's website, you will see that their undergraduate tuition is 53,000 US dollars per year. That's nominal official rate, 50, around 53. That's just for academics. You also have to pay for your housing and living costs. And I think the official number that they're given is about 19,000. So if you add 53 and 19, you're gonna to get to 72. That's the nominal official number. Now, on the same website, they disclose another uh, important piece of information where they say that on average, instead of 72, our students actually only pay about 20,000 because MIT, along with other, again, big, big well-known schools like Harvard, they provide a lot of financial support to their students to make sure that smart students can afford the education financially. So they do provide a lot, a lot of support. Okay, that's so great. Lots of opportunities are there. Uh, well, let's say uh, somebody became a student of MIT. Let's talk about uh, having a friend at MIT, like-minded people, smart people, and the atmosphere there. Could you tell about this? How was it? It was interesting. Well, again, we have to we have to remember that, for example, the business school, where, where part, part of which I was, mm -hmm. uh, is its own unit. So they have their own atmosphere. Then the School of Engineering has its own atmosphere. Of course, people communicate. But as always, you first make uh, friends in, in, in your circle. Say, if you work in an engineering lab, that would be your immediate circle of friends. And then, of course, everything is open at MIT, by the way. The campus is open. So you can walk into an engineering school, talk to people. So except for, of course, some labs with equipment. Mm. Everything is open. You can walk through the halls. You can see where people work and study. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of ways to make friends. Again, it, it, it mostly depends on students. Mm -hmm. if, if they really want to make friends across departments, all the opportunities are there. One interesting thing uh, they do, it's not unique, but it's actually a very, very good initiative. They run what's called an independent activities period. Every January for about three weeks when the school is not in session, they run like a series of lectures, many lectures across the university, for, that are open not only to MIT people, but also to, to the wider community. So you can come and listen to a lecture led by a famous astronomer, given to public that is not studying astronomy, right? So basically astronomy for regular people. And I attended some of these, it's really interesting. You can meet a lot of people, make new friends at MIT or beyond. Thank you. Uh, next question will be a bit interesting. Was there anything unexpected at MIT? Was there anything unexpected at MIT? Yes. Well, okay. Uh, one one thing I can tell you again when I first got well, first of all, I started in a PhD program, uh -huh. so it's, it's it's obviously quite different from undergrad. But I still had I knew people from different programs at different sort of stages, different ages. And one thing I personally noticed uh, when I first was coming, I thought the way you guys asked me at the beginning is, do you have to be a genius? And yeah. I, don't, I don't consider myself a genius. I'm like, okay, I'm a hardworking guy, but I'm not a genius. So when I came there, I'm like, well, is everybody else smarter than me? Yeah. And what you realize, if you work hard enough, they're, they're normal people, right? So not everybody's a genius. They're stronger students, they're weaker students. The average level is, of course, very high. But in any class, right, you feel if you work hard enough, you feel that, you know, you actually deal with normal people, with normal people's problems, issues, uh, and, you know, again, you make friends, so this was a bit unexpected. So they're not, they're not all robots, they're uh -huh. not all geniuses. Yes. There are some really, really, really bright people. Some of them are really hard to talk to because they are looking at you and thinking about math. <laughs> they, you get the integrals. We had a guy whose nickname was Integral. Okay. Because they're literally the integrals coming out of his head. Okay. There are people like that. But most people are normal people. Interesting. Students and faculty as well, professors as well. Even the very famous ones, they're very nice very approachable and just very friendly. Yes, not everyone has to be genius to study at MIT University. Okay, uh, the next question, it's like world top university and what kind of opportunities are available for MIT students while they start studying there? 
Well, uh, it's, it is, it is a uh, multi-dimensional question. There are many, many opportunities obviously available. It is a large established university. Many companies uh, come to recruit there. Many famous speakers come to talk at MIT. Uh, so again, it's mainly, it's what you're willing to get. As a student, of course, you always have to balance your time. It's about how you want to allocate your time. You can literally go and attend, say, guest lectures every day from 9 to 6 p.m. Because there, there are things happening, there are dozens of things, dozens of lectures happening every day. Of course, you cannot do it physically, right? You need to study, you need to, to rest. So it basically, it, the opportunities, the number of opportunities are enormous. Uh, again, including getting access to very top people, top academicians. Uh, MIT is associated with, affiliated with 98 Nobel Prize winners. 98 Nobel? 98. Wow. There are only three countries in the world that have more Nobel Prize winners than a university, the MIT. US, UK, and Germany. Germany, I think, is 111. Okay. So MIT would be number four on the list of countries. <laughs> okay. And I think there are 11 or 12 Nobel, current Nobel Prize winners working at MIT. So you have access to wide variety of people and a lot of them, yes, they're busy, but also, yes, they're very nice and approachable people. So you can approach them, you can mix with them, you can talk to them. But of course, it's always a student's job to make the first step. Yes. So the opportunities are whatever you're willing to take. Mm -hmm. So cool, thank you very much. And the next question, let's say study is over, you successfully finished MIT. Where do alumni work and what about you? What was your career path after graduating MIT? Well, uh, MIT alumni work, well, basically everywhere in the sense that you have to remember it's a university with a 160-year-old history. Yes. Uh, it's not the biggest, but it's pretty big. It graduates, I think if you look at the statistics, it graduates about 2,000 people a year. Mm -hmm. So over many decades, there are tens of thousands of MIT graduates. I don't know the exact number. Uh, obviously, because it's one of the top science schools, uh, many companies that deal with science, anything from computer science, obviously engineering, uh, com I I anything around science and math and uh, all of these things, they, they employ a lot of MIT graduates. Government agencies, of course, do. NASA, CIA, FBI, all of these things, what you see in movies, that are actually true. <laughs> they do also employ M uh, MIT graduates as analysts. And of course, uh, private private business. They they employ a uh, big companies. Of course, employ MIT graduates as well. Uh, the good thing is that they actually come uh, to campus. Large employers come to recruit to MIT and say Harvard. So these are the two biggest names in Boston. And and students have a lot of opportunities to to get good jobs. If again, as long as they're trying hard. My personal story to keep it to keep it to keep it quick and simple. Yes. <laughs> uh, when I finished MIT, again I finished the PhD program, and in, in the PhD program they prepare you to, to work in academia, to yeah. teach and do research. So my first uh, job, my first placement after MIT, I went to the University of Southern California, where I was uh, tenure track uh, faculty, tenure track uh, assistant professor for several years. So I worked and did research there and taught. Uh, and after that, I decided to go global, so I worked in several countries, including uh, China, Kazakhstan, Cambodia. Uh, I've gained international experience in Asia, broadly defined. And now I've been in Uzbekistan for three years. I am Vice Rector for Academic Affairs at the British Management University. And I am, I am really, really excited to be here because I strongly believe that we're building something quite unique. Uh, that again, the university that follows global standards in education and the university that will serve for many years to come will serve the country of Uzbekistan and the students of Uzbekistan. Well, thank you very much. That's so interesting. And the last thing is, uh, could you give some advice to those people who are watching, aspiring applicants who want to study at MIT like you? What would you suggest to them? Good question. Let me try to, again, quickly answer it in three, four pieces. Now, first of all, dream big. Dreaming is important, right? You have to, you have to dream to achieve things. So that's number one, dream big. Number one is work hard. Because in order for your dreams to come true, you need to work towards your dream. Silly example, if I say I want to be an astronaut. Well, if I'm not doing anything to achieve it, it's just a dream. 
is great, but there's no footing for this dream. There's no foundation. It's not growing, okay? So you have to work hard towards your dreams. And you also have to be number three, probably the most important, or at least as important. You need to be realistic and strategic towards your dreams. So again, I can have any dream I want, but I have to ask myself, well, am I actually ready for it? Am I ready to be an astronaut? Now, I may, it may be my dream, but if I'm not ready, it probably will not come true, right? Now, so you have to be realistic and strategic, because at MIT, for example, if you say you're graduating from high school, say, I want to be at MIT, okay, well, that's a great dream, and you're working hard, but you may or may not be ready. So what may happen is MIT and any other university has different levels, undergraduate, master's, PhD. So I went as a PhD student. Mm -hmm. I guess I wasn't ready as an undergraduate. I, I never thought about it, right? But you can, again, think in, in, in multi-stage, multi-year type of thing, that if you cannot do it now, if you're not ready now, you may be ready later. Again, if you prepare, work hard, you get it, you cannot get to, to MIT or another big American school now, you may be able to do it in five years. Yes. So plan ahead, strategic, realistic, work hard, dream big. Thank you very much. That was a very motivational answer. And if you guys also have any kind of questions, please leave in the comments below. So we'll try to answer them. And if you have any kind of requests to make more videos about MIT or Mr. Uh, Mr. Yuri, so we'll be very glad to make this. And thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank, thank you very much. Have a good day.